The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're back with another very special interview I'm really excited about. We're here with Max Frooms, who's the author of The Caesar's Palace Coup, How a Billionaire Brawl Over the Famous Casino Exposed the Power and Greed of Wall Street. So as I've mentioned before on this podcast, I kind of have a rule that the first time somebody recommends a book, I'll put it on my list. Second time, I'll bump it to the top. Third time, I'll pull the trigger. And for whatever reason, I had three or four people that I really like recommend this book to me all at once in January. And I just read it and absolutely loved it. I would put it right up there with Liar's Poker, Barbarians at the Gate, Monkey Business, The Big Short, in terms of just the behind the scenes inside baseball kind of look at how a little corner of Wall Street actually works. And there are some moments in this book that are so hilarious and so cringe inducing. I don't even know how to quite describe them. We'll get into a few of them. But anyway, Max joins us today. He leads a team at Fitch Ratings covering corporate debt and restructuring activities. He was previously the founding editor, uh, editor of a bankruptcy publication. Before that, he was at S&P in the Leverage Commentary Group. He graduated from Berkeley's, did a master's at Medill. And so, Max, thank you for joining us. Uh, Phil, thanks, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And so I want to I want to dive right in. This this book is aptly described by you guys as the most brutal corporate restructuring in Wall Street history. So why is that? Give us a little bit of background about the case and tell us why you think this one happened to get so nasty and so ugly. Uh, great, thank you for the intro, and uh, and let's give uh, you know, full credit to my co-author Sajid Indab from the Financial Times. Uh, who uh, you know were toiled along with me for uh, the better part of four years to to research and write this book, um, and I, I, I we thought that the Caesars, while there have been larger bankruptcies where there was um, you know more assets and more liabilities, uh, uh, there have not been more contentious ones, and we thought that that was because this represented the fundamental investment thesis for distressed debt investors going back uh, a long time, which is good company, bad balance sheet. There are fewer and fewer of those opportunities, but that was Caesars uh, at, the, at the time that very, you know, very quickly after its mega LBO in 2008. Um, and the reason was that it, this was one of those mega LBOs that happened at the, the, the height of the market, which was uh, agreed to in 2006, but didn't close until 2008 on the eve of the financial crisis. And uh, it, it, so it, the valuations were sky high and uh, it ultimately the uh, impact to the company itself uh, wound up being so uh, dramatic uh, for a number of reasons that it couldn't pay its debt service. And uh, uh, because one of the peculiarities of the private equity sponsor, Apollo, um, and they were so creative and so brilliant, so um, uh, 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 aggressive in their liability management uh, of the, the giant capital structure, which was about $25 billion about at the close of the LBO, uh, uh, to keep, you know, extend the runway until the company bounced back. Uh, that it it angered a lot of the creditors, and the creditors themselves wound up becoming you know, uh, uh, distressed debt investors. Uh, uh, with the main examples being Oak Tree and Appaloosa in this case, uh, who were adverse to Apollo, who had their you know like there were these heavyweights on the other side of it. So you had uh, heavyweights, you know, <laughs> famous billionaire investors and very influential, well capitalized. Um, investment firms on both sides, on many sides of these transactions, 
fighting over the uh, uh, you know, essentially the fate of this company uh, and the control of this this company and the recoveries in a restructuring uh, uh, made this uh, we think the 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 most brutal uh, fight on Wall Street. One thing that that jumped out to me too was that you mentioned so this we'll get into a little of the weeds and the terms and the technical technicalities here. So John, you guys jump in if we're, we're throwing around terms that aren't clear to people. But one thing that jumped out to me was as I was preparing for this, reading the end notes is, so Apollo came along, they, they probably overpaid for this. They kind of admit they overpaid for this right on the precipice of the financial crisis. And then the whole thing kind of blows up 09, 2010. It's pretty clear they're going to hit a wall, but they're able to keep the company on life support by basically shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic and what other creditors ultimately deemed was asset stripping, right? Like taking away the collateral that they thought they were entitled to. And they got the blessing of various parties. And, and one thing that jumped out was that Paul Weiss, the, the law firm, uh, decided to basically go scorched earth on you guys, threatening to sue you and Sujit for defamation before a first draft of the book even existed. So, I mean, doesn't that kind of tell you all you need to know about how implicit they were in kind of pushing this into the gray area, if not, you know, past the gray area? Uh, I, well, uh, without, without getting too much hot water, I think it, it, that's very indicative. Part of that is, is uh, I think that the threats weren't as explicit as all of that. Uh, it was, but it was... Uh, 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 asking to see a, uh, a you know a copy of the manuscript before we had even had one, uh, you know, to look for things that could have led to defamation claims, and, and but yeah, I you know this this whole case it brought up um, uh, you know, two things. One was um, uh, you, you know what is proper corporate governance for a company that is heading towards insolvency right and then what are what are what are the conflicts of interest uh in the different sides of a company that has creditor constituencies and shareholders uh, who are going to be adverse to one another if a company is heading towards insolvency and then what are the lengths of the advocacy uh, that you know, law firms, uh, investment banks, and the like that are you know beholden to their private equity clients, uh, uh, who, who are you know really supposed to be representing uh, the debtor or, or different parties. And in this case, it you know it brought up a very interesting question uh, uh, that uh, you know at least was somewhat answered by the um, uh, independent examiner in the case. Uh, which was, you know, at what point was uh, Caesar's insolvent, and therefore, at, at, at that point, did did the creditors or, or the opco that had issued all the debt um, that was being uh, 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 compromised at this time deserve their own representation and the decisions that the company was making? So before that, Paul Weiss was operating as the counsel to. Uh, both the debtors uh, and the, the sponsor, uh, and you know, ultimately they had to replace them as counsel for the the debtors. Kirk Lanella stepped up, and then when the examiner's report came out, you know, they were they were kind of re- replaced entirely in, in this one scenario. But uh, what we I think did a great job in reporting uh, for the very first time in this book was the extent to which. Apollo was such a key client for this very influential law firm uh, that uh, you know has, has been has put it felt itself forward as a, you know a law firm that is for social justice and a, a number of uh, um, uh, you know like very prominent causes. Uh, also being you know, a zealous advocate for uh, all things related to Apollo, up to and including. Uh, uh, you know, representate representing Leon Black uh, with regards to his, his current trouble, you know, various legal troubles uh, after he had to step away from the CEO role. So, it, you know, that that was they were the top client for for Paul Weiss, and up to I think we we got confirmed about seven percent of the revenue, but we we heard anecdotally it was more than that. That's a lot for one client. And, uh, and, you know, I think that you can't help but have your behavior shaped by that. 
Um, yeah. and, you know, but it was it wasn't just them. I think it it was you know it was it was also uh, 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 you know Kirkland and Ellis has a huge um, uh, practice of representing private equity firms, and that has helped their tra- uh, restructuring practice. Right in this, it was interesting that, that Paul Apollo was like one. <laughs> One of the, the private equity firms they didn't have um, as many mandates with, but it's it's pervasive in the industry uh, to you know be beholden to uh, a, a, you know very very powerful and and you know uh, influential large money you know in, uh, fund managers, uh, even though you you know you should you could be representing parties that are adverse to them. Yeah, right. So uh, on that note, I mean, look, I've. By the way, I think the incentives do tell all the stories here, right? Because show me the incentives, I'll show you the behavior, as the saying goes, right? And I think it's just plain as day to anyone who reads the book how conflicted and, and obviously conflicted various parties were, everyone from the advisors and the lawyers to the kind of stooge directors that were, were put in place at the company. So, and we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. It's a very small world, right? Like everybody knows everybody. Often, very close personal relationships, professional fates, all very tied closely together. And so you, you mentioned um, that it, I think you interviewed 200 people and read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents in the, in the multi-year process to, to research this book. So I'm curious what it was like in the in the weeds actually writing the book and whether it was difficult to get people to even talk. You mentioned that pretty much everybody wanted to speak only on background. So were they happy to talk? as long as it was on background or, you know, what, what was that whole process like? Yeah. Thanks. This, I love these questions about the reporting process of, uh, you know, like the dark corners of wall street. Right. I, uh, um, and it, you know, there's a funny saying, <laughs> I forget who came up with it, but it's, it's like, uh, as a business reporter, you call up your sources and they won't even give you the time on the record. Right. <laughs> So I, I, it, what we have to do as journalists is start a lot of conversations on background. What on background means is uh, uh, there's no attribution to the person you're talking to or to that conversation, but you can use the information in a story. And what this does is it, it separates maybe the accountability. Whereas if you can get a, you know, if you can get an executive or someone to comment on the record, that means that they're out there in your story according to, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, executive from, uh, you know, this, this fund. A- and that's their position. That's clearly their agenda. If they're giving it to you on background, you have to negotiate. Well, is it a source familiar with the matter? Is it a source that's familiar with Caesar's thinking? Is it a source familiar with Apollo's thinking? And, uh, you know, this really allows, uh, you know, the different Wall Street firms to manipulate the narrative. And our job as, as journalists in this world are to uh, try to get the truth out of it. And in order to do that, you have to triangulate. So in this case, there were a lot of emotions and there was a lot, like, there was a lot of money at stake. And ultimately, at the time where we were going back and reporting on this, the, the, um, the, the company filed for bankruptcy in 2015, uh, and it lasted for two years. The plan was uh, confirmed and emerged later in 2017. Uh, and, we, you know, we were reporting it uh, out in, in 2018, 19, uh, and then writing it in 2020, published in 2021. Uh, so we had people had time to cool a little bit and they had made so much money. <laughs> there were su- a lot of them were super happy to talk about it. And so they gave us their, you know, their version of uh, how, you know, much like they were super geniuses and they they did this and uh, were able to, um, you know, beat their adversaries like this. And so that gave us uh, leverage to then go back to the other side that may not have um, come out ahead. In this case, uh, the biggest loser was uh, Apollo and TPG. And that they made the initial equity investment in the LBO, and they as hard as they fought, uh, ultimately had to lose that entire initial equity check, uh, and the creditors were able to take over, and not all of them who bought it pennies on the dollar wound up recovering par or above. It was it was, it was miraculous. There's a lot of really really happy winners here, uh, and a, a couple of uh, you know not so happy losers. 
Uh, but once you get one side of the story, um, you know, other people want to tell, well, say it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't all cut and dried, right? It wasn't all because they were brilliant. There's a lot of luck involved here too. Um, and so that's what I, I think made so many people eager to talk. Uh, it was these different motivations that they had and, you know, getting out a, a you know, good story that would document uh, maybe perhaps a victory or setting the record straight so that there was a, a lot more color on, you know, just how, uh, you know, the battle was fought. And, uh, and yeah, like it was, it was, it was a very gratifying experience, but certainly very difficult when you have people who all have different agendas or uh, expert at trying to manipulate the narrative, telling you different things. Yeah. It's gotta be hard to, to sort that all out. And, and like you said, I mean, Apollo comes off looking like the villain here in a lot of ways, and particularly some of the personal behavior was, you know, as my kids would say, cringeworthy, it uh, doesn't even quite cover it. Did they, did they push back? Was Apollo cooperative or did they refuse or did they just say you're, you're getting it wrong, but you have three sources that confirm it. So you kind of go with it or, or what was their response like? Uh, well, I'm, you know, I, we, we're not going to disclose who all we talked to. Right. Sure. Um, but I, I, like we did go back to every single person and company who was mentioned and told them exactly how what was going to come out of the book and gave much an opportunity to respond and to right. uh, 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 you know add information and tell us whether or not it was incorrect and that you know that process uh, while laborious was helpful and you know there's been no major errors that we we've heard on any side so they it, you know, people may not be happy with their characterization, but so far, right. uh, no one is uh, is really disputing uh, any, any major major facts in this book. And you know, and I think that like our philosophy going in was, you know, not that there are good guys or bad guys. It's not it's not a Manichean story of good versus evil, right? Like at, at the at the end of the day a lot like most of these firms don't look that great right that most of the motivation here is to make a lot of money uh and there's just some self-righteousness attached to it in this case because it does seem that there was you know truly egregious behavior on on the part of um uh, apollo uh and the, the sponsors in their uh liability management uh of of this right in, in trying to extend that runway um which all right, it, it, the examiner really gave uh the the voice to and we we refer to richard davis who's former he was a like a former watergate prosecutor who was the examiner that was chosen in this case just did this phenomenal job of getting you know like getting people to talk that we never would have been able to get to talk and putting that all on the record in this 1800 page report uh, and he came out and, you know, he, he, he made real judgment calls that we relied upon, um, extensively. And, uh, and, and while, you know, none of it is, is, uh, legally binding, um, he said that there were very strong claims for, uh, actual, not constructive, just, you know, actual and constructive fraudulent conveyance in this claim, in this case, in, in addition to, Different, you know, corporate uh, 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 misgovernance and uh, 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 claims to the tune of five billion dollars, and that was extreme. It was, you know, there could be, well, whoops, we we, you know, what uh, we stripped out an asset, uh, uh, you know, to to try to extend the runway, and we lent against it, and maybe we didn't give the full, like the, the best valuation, but it was an accident, you know, it was an accident. We didn't think that we were insolvent. We didn't think the, the those are things that you know it could be constructive. Um, fraudulent convey. This was this was actual, uh, and so it you know that that was part of the uh, you know the I think uh, really unique por- uh, portions of this where you have this uh, a very um, uh, uh, you know well respected objective third party who came in here and got you know very good access to all the key players. And had a, you know a huge staff and its own his own investment bank and firm to you know go through millions of documents right <laughs> more way more than than we had access to and then come down with this report 
right. uh, so I, I and it's a, for anyone who's really interested that examiner's report it's public it's out there and very much at least worth a, a read of the executive summary yeah and one one last thing on the issue of incentives that i thought was a really fascinating point you guys made in the book was that you know look they it, apollo and tpg made this huge LBO. And obviously the price and the time were dead wrong, even if it proved to be, you know, quote unquote, correct 10 or 12 years later in the sense that the enterprise value was recovered eventually. But along the way, you had this massive amount of value destruction and all sorts of shenanigans going on. And you had total, I think the total fees charged by the law firms just in the two-year restructuring was $273 million, right? Over a quarter billion dollars, (laughs) according to the the final fee approval from the judge. So you you guys made the point that, you know, the incentives here are for everybody to make the most amount of money for themselves, which is basically diverting money from the investment, from the business itself into their own pockets and that they're all capitalized, right? All the big players in this story were all capitalized by basically the same handful of limited partners, right? Like big pension funds and, and sovereign wealth funds. So have you ever gotten a read? Have any of those ultimate LPs read the book and, and kind of realized that, or is that just kind of acknowledged, but not talked about? Uh, both. I, I, you know, we got out there on the, uh, right. The capital allocators podcast and uh, it's, it's made, it, it's made the rounds to a lot of the LPs. I, I mean, I suppose the Venn diagram isn't as, as uh, like overlapping as, as, as we would make it seem, but there are, especially for Apollo Oak Tree and the, the, the largest private equity firms there, there, um, that are in this book and the hedge funds uh, and, and the, you know, the multiple the multi-asset managers, multi-strategy asset managers, those are going to all get some allocation from like CalSTRS, CalPERS and Texas right. teachers and the, and the like. And that, and that is a great point, right? It is, and it's like, you know... <laughs> Uh, it, it, you could charge lower fees and, uh, uh, you know, maybe beat each other up a little bit less and, you know, our overall portfolio would improve. Uh, but it, it, because, you know, you all, it, it's not as much of an overlap and, and, you know, there, there, it is still an ego game, uh, the, and the funds, they have the discretion and if they're, um, yeah, if their returns are, are better than their competitors, then it's there's the survivor bias where you know the LPs will start to give them more. Um, so I mean it's it's a I, I, it, it was it's an interesting point, and I think in the you know the point that's not made enough is if you're looking at things through the lens of, of business ethics and um, you know even ESG or or like what is what is the responsible thing to do here? Who are the most vulnerable stakeholders? In this case, they're hardly ever talked about, which are the pensioners, the employees, right. and and it, you know, in this case, it's it's like oh, it's kind of an afterthought, right? The creditors themselves that are the like the lenders, they step into the role of what would have been you know the institutional investors, the mutual funds, uh, um, and, and it, it, the the insurance companies that bought the debt at par, uh, they bought it at thirty cents on the dollar and stepped into that role and said. Hey, we're you know we're getting a raw deal here, and we're standing up for the sanctity of the credit you know the the credit market. Um, meanwhile, I, I don't know. It's it's really tough to say uh, how much um, uh, you know you can you can say okay, what's a better system uh, if you know if these experts in restructuring and, and distressed debt investing these negotiations don't step in there, then you know they could get steamrolled. By a by a sponsor, uh, and that you know I think that does happen uh, more and more. Uh, so it's it's tough to say what a better system is, but I I do think that right the the most vulnerable stakeholders uh, uh, that don't have real um, uh, rep- like it, as 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 vigorous and expensive representation in most of these mega bankruptcies. Right. No, I agree. I don't think there's necessarily a way to, I think the horse is out of the barn, basically. I don't think you can improve it once you get to this point, right? Once you write the check as a limited partner, once the fund makes the investment, once the investment gets sideways and ends up in in bankruptcy, I mean, that that is, you know, the, the process I think actually works reasonably well. It's just 
getting to that point, right? The incentives kind of metastasize on themselves and you get these crazy bonkers results. But, you know, I, I guess it would just be interesting to make every investment committee at every one of these large allocators read this book before they write another check. Right? That was kind of my, my thought on that. I know that's, that's hey, impractical. You're, you're, do it. I, I love yeah. it. I love, <laughs> and I think it, it, no, I really do think it is helping in a lot of ways. I, you know, like even throughout, throughout this case, uh, Apollo did have to go on this mini apology tour. He included a little uh, anecdote about that where, uh, it, you know, it was, you know, some creditors were so vehemently opposed to some of the stuff that they had done. There was this Apollo premium so that the, the deals, uh, their, you know, their buyouts, uh, that required, uh, new debt were being charged a, a, a premium because people were like, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it, when push comes to shove it, right? Like we're going to get the wrong end of the deal here. If it's a, if it's an oh, Apollo yeah. deal. They went on an apology tour for, you know, for that reason said, you know, we're going to like, we're going to try not to do these types of, of things that uh, so alienate uh, our, you know, our, our uh, valued, um, uh, 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 you know, colleagues and peers in the market who are going to buy the debt on these deals. And that premium, I, you know, like I, I cover this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that premium went away. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much the same. You know, so two things happened. The premium went away, but then <laughs> every private equity firm saw Apollo do what they did in Caesars and were like, oh, okay, you know what? The reason they didn't get away with that was they didn't appoint direct, independent directors soon enough. Right. So two things happened. Apollo actually modified their behavior, I think, you know, probably a little bit more towards the, the cautious and conservative. And then, you know, other sponsors modified their behavior more towards the aggressive. So now you see the, this, this type of, uh, you know, like uh, aggressive, um, let's say, credit exchanges, asset stripping, um, uh, you know, refinancing efforts by many sponsors, including Oak Tree, right, which was the, you know, one of the unsecured creditors in this, or the junior creditors in this case, part of the second lien group. But, you know, they're out there uh, doing very similar deals that are uh, um, kind of priming junior creditors and leaving them with lower recovery estimates. Uh, so, that, yeah, the, those are kind of the results of it. I, I think it's good to have exposure, as much transparency as many of these stories can get told uh, that that'll that'll improve things slightly. Uh, but, you know, there's always a little push and a pull. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I don't getting Apollo was already a term and a risk that people were familiar with long before you know, long before this bankruptcy came to a head. That's for sure. But like you pointed out, yeah. they certainly haven't had any trouble raising money even since, uh, despite the myriad problems uh, at the firm. So I, it's fascinating. I want to ask three quick questions about kind of the legal side. One of the more interesting and shocking uh, legal ang angles here was that the judge in the case opened the door uh, to at least the potential for personal liability on the on the senior executives at at Apollo. Do you think that threat really had the potential for any teeth? I mean, at one point, Oak Tree joked about you know getting discovery and putting the the personal bank account details of the senior guys at Apollo on a billboard in Times Square. But I mean, that, that's as fascinating that's as that threat joke. might. Yeah, as fascinating as that joke and threat might be. I just didn't seem like they took it seriously. I mean, do you think that'll ever come up again? Do you think that'll be any sort of issue or even, God forbid, a deterrent at anything at any point in the future? Well, I do think it was, a, you know, I, I actually think that was one of the key inflection points in this case. They would never admit it. Uh, and, you know, we we do, you know, we do couch it in terms of there were many, many reasons uh, why, Apollo was was heading towards the you know the the same result anyways where they were willing to walk away from their initial entire initial equity investment, um, uh, but I, you know we it, it there are a couple of timing things about the deal that show that after uh, the uh, the the judge approved this essentially discovery request that would have delved into their personal financials. Not necessarily that it would have gotten to the point where they were personally liable, but you know, with this judge, it was it was kind of like a a little bit of a unknown too. 
So that we do think, you know, I, I, a lot of people thought that that was one of the inflection points where it really was like, all right, you know what, we're going to strike a deal here. And yeah. it, it, there's, there's always a lot of factors that go into that, but ultimately this, it, it, the timing of it did seem like it was, it was a, a pretty important factor in, um, uh, you know, persuading them to, to settle and then stick with the settlement. Because one of the, key, like on the day of confirmation, one of the key uh, legal precedents that was working against them was was kind of reversed when you know with respect to the marble gate and education management case um and, you know and and their lawyer called them up quickly and you know it was like should we you know should we stop it right now and say no deal and they're just like go go for it you know like i think it it may it, it was definitely a factor that they you know uh that coincided with the timing and the, the the persistence of the the settlement in this case and i think is something that that will be a factor going forward right i, I think like this book and uh all of the great reporting on the purdue pharma bankruptcy uh and a lot of the other um yeah, you know opioid bankruptcies uh um you know malincroft was another opioid producer that went into bankruptcy that's you know it's been an interesting story uh, uh, th- you know, they are bringing up these questions of, of personal liability, uh, that I think benefit from this type of, of scrutiny and exposure and, you know, ultimately should be held up as an example for why, you know, it's better business just to be a little bit more personally responsible, um, or ethical. Right. So, so I, yeah, I, I think it, it was a factor in this case. You know, the fact that it ultimately didn't get to that point, um, you know, and who knows what's going to happen with the Purdue settlement, um, uh, you know, we'll see. But I, I think that that I think that, that, that bankruptcy is such an, a unique forum where you have this, you know, you have this business. Right. And this business is run by individuals and owned by individuals. And if those individuals, you know, do something bad. Um, and the company goes into bankruptcy because of it, you know, like what responsibility do they hold? Well, if it's just monetary, maybe nothing, right? If it's beyond that, then maybe there is something more where it can break through that. Uh, And that's a real interesting issue for the bankruptcy process right now. Yeah, speaking of, I wonder what your thoughts are on venue shopping. For anyone who's who's not familiar, that's the idea that when a company gets into trouble and needs to restructure in court, there's some ability in certain circumstances to kind of pick the the, the state and the court that they're going to be trying the bankruptcy case in. And in this case, it's kind of ironic, don't you think? I, I wonder if you agree with my assessment that originally uh, there was a push toward Delaware, including from the second lien counsel at Jones Day, Bruce Bennett, who, who really wanted... Delaware, they ended up getting a judge in Chicago where I believe there were nine potential judges assigned um, that that could have come up and they they really didn't want just one of them. They would have been okay with eight of the nine. And of course, they got the one of the nine that they didn't want. He was known as somewhat of a wild card and he certainly did produce some wild card moments. But I think you wrote in the book, which I think was a great point, that he was probably one of the very, very few judges in America that actually gave them enough latitude to try their case. Um, so I, I wonder if you agree with that. And then also if you think it, it's kind of another angle of this, right? Like as the tools get sharper, people are just going to continue shopping for the the venue and the judge of their choice to the extent they can. Right. Absolutely. So that I, the, the Caesars case is extraordinary for this reason also because it, it was where venue shopping was attempted, but wound up being an, an exception to what is the norm currently and even, you know, even for the past several years uh, in the mega bankruptcy world. And, and that norm is that uh, the, the private equity owners or the, uh, you know, the, the shareholders, people controlling a debtor uh, or, you know, a, a, a company that is going into bankruptcy um, can uh, like almost target a jurisdiction and a judge uh, that will be 
uh, friendly to a, a kind of a debtor side restructuring or a sponsor side restructuring. And what that means is there will be third party releases, right, that are frequently given in that uh, in, in that jurisdiction, uh, and or you know that's a it's a judge that is known for being a, a, a deals judge. Uh, and in the past several years, there's been you know a couple of papers out on this recently. Uh, it was it was remarkable, and it was like something like sixty percent of mega bankruptcies were going to three judges, uh, right? The, the two that were in Houston, and then and then Judge Drain. Um, and it, you know, you, it, if you filed in in White Plains, you were um, you were guaranteed to get uh, um, you know a specific judge. And uh, uh, so that you know that is kind of the norm in this case. It, they they thought that Chicago and you know Illinois in, in in particular could have been a good venue for them for a number of different reasons, including uh, the the third party releases. Uh, but because they they got um, Judge Goldgar, uh, and you know for various different reasons, he, he, he you know he he didn't allow the case to proceed at a a, a pace. That that would have benefited the sponsors and the uh, the people that controlled the company, uh, and yeah, so I, I think it was de- it was very it was very fortuitous for the junior creditors in, in this in this point, and then ultimately he made some decisions that um, uh, other judges might not have made. Yeah, and, and to hammer home the point, I, I think there are various scenarios where the junior creditors who are buying up a lot of their claims between what, 10 and 30 cents on the dollar, I think at various points along the way and thought, Mm -hmm. boy, a total home run here would be 50 cents. And they ended up getting par plus (laughs) through, through some equity recoveries. I mean, this was a a swing of like $3 billion, right. That could have been limited quote unquote to just a billion or two had the the, the judge not given them this latitude. So it it really was meaningful. And the last thing I want to bring up on the, on the, courtroom and the judge side of things was just there were like four or five moments in this book where I was reading most of it on an airplane and my wife had thought I lost my mind because I was laughing out loud at this nerdy finance book but one of them that I think everybody listening to this podcast will appreciate is there's a moment in the courtroom where uh, one of the advisors is is presenting his analysis and he comes up with a six billion dollar theoretical equity value for the new Caesars which he calls quote an intrinsic value a term that I'm sure all of us are familiar with, but uh, the co-head of restructuring at Houlihan and the judge himself start attacking this term. And they said, so intrinsic value is not a technical term in corporate finance circles. It's a Brendan Hayes term from his testimony before. And he goes on, yes, this, this is not a term I commonly use when I'm talking about shares or anything like that. And so the, the lawyers pick up on this and they say, let me ask you a question. That you don't use the term intrinsic value is that a common and acceptedly and, and generally accepted corporate finance term? And the head of restructuring at Houlihan says, "I don't believe it is." No, the lawyer goes on. Okay, now there are treatises that are written about corporate finance and corporate valuations, authoritative treatises that you would recognize as such. Yes, there are. Have you heard of Graham and Dodd, their treatise or a book on security analysis? You go on to say that you know, obviously Graham and Dodd are kind of the godfathers of a fundamental analysis and their classic textbook. And you quoted, you're quoted in the book as saying, or you wrote in the book that they were as famous as finance thinkers could be, but apparently not famous enough for the co-head of restructuring at Houlihan and Loki, at which point he admitted, I have actually not heard of them. And the lawyer responds, you have not heard of that. And the judge continues to admit that he's not heard of that. And as soon as the hearing ends, Kirk Linnell ships a copy of security analysis to Hilti's office in New York. So I, I found that whole thing both kind of frightening and and pretty hilarious. So I, I don't know how that story came up, but I just I, I sent that around to several people I knew as soon as I read it. It was great. It was great. Yeah, I, you had to have heard of it, right? <laughs> like, that's what I mean. You know, so like, if you got a, I think it's if you got a judge, right? Like you know, like part of this is reading the judge, and uh, you know, yeah. you, got, you got a judge who's kind of like for for a lot of different reasons, he had a lot of skepticism about the right the debtors advisors and uh, uh you know their their uh framing of things at this point so this was just you know hildy just gave him just enough of an excuse to kind of dismiss 
uh, uh, the you know their their explanation of intrinsic value, which was which was pretty funny. Yeah, I, I, it was it was amazing. And again, e- even if this was a tactic they they tried to play willful ignorance, I don't I don't think it was <laughs> successful at it. it was, anyway, so I I've been going on up. John Elliot, do you guys want to jump in with anything before we wrap up? Well, that last story was fascinating to me. I think the whole thing was really interesting. Um, you know, I I like reflect back on uh, how much things have changed in finance. I, I guess in the in the backdrop of the economy from when this whole ordeal started to where it's at now. See Caesars out there as like a publicly traded security stock again, and you know, I just wonder. Um, geez, I what you think of um the future of these kinds of big buyouts do you think there is a little bit of a pause that people take in different valuation environments like what do you, what do you think are some of the big uh ramifications down the line here yeah i i mean that's that's a great will we ever see another heyday of the uh you know private equity club deal to uh you know to to produce a mega buyout at the top of the market um and uh, they're frothy enough probably but i I think that the uh, what we're more likely to see is what happened in 2020, where, where there's these abbreviated moments of opportunity where these the largest invest in, uh, 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 investors who have sophisticated distressed investing uh, strategies raise a ton of money, buy up a lot of assets, uh, you know, on the cheap. Uh, and, and, you know, and aim and, and then, you know, aim to have dry powder or the ability to raise capital quickly to take advantage of those environments. Uh, and then, you know, I don't know, like maybe the fiscal stimulus will come in and, and ruin those opportunities quickly. Like they, or, or you know, I don't know, at least bring the market back up to the point where they're not as discounted as they were. But we saw that Apollo came back in, is in, you know, is, is going to be on the Las Vegas strip again with the acquisition of the Venetian. And, uh, and, you know, one of the, uh, uh you know, main, uh, players in the Caesars, uh, uh saga, David Sam- Samber from, from Apollo, uh, you know, subsequently appointed to be the co-head of private equity at, um, at, uh, uh, Apollo. Uh, he got up in front of the, the Nevada, uh, gaming commission and, uh, uh you know, he gave public commentary on the differences between the two deals. Venetian was at the bottom of the market. <laughs> like there was very, there wasn't as much debt. Um, it, you know, it wasn't, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a much different opportunity. Uh, and they, they learned their lessons, uh, on when to, you know, try to get into, to what is you know, these hot markets. So I think, you know, that that's at least one of the, the lessons about, you know, I don't know, mega buyouts, um, by these investors that have experience in this, uh, you know, other, other things where distressed investing is going are, they're kind of interesting in that in the last year or so where debt capital has been very cheap, uh, there was so much, uh, stimulus that came into the markets that bailed out companies that might have otherwise needed to go through a restructuring that nothing has been that cheap. Um, they've gone toward, they've, they've now started calling themselves opportunistic credit investors, right? Or special situations investors, like nothing is really distressed and, and they have to get creative in the ways that they deploy capital and get involved. And that, that takes the form of, uh, you know, writing huge checks in situations that are, uh, uh, uh you know, like somewhat fraught in the case, like in recent cases, um, like talent energy, uh, or looking at distressed stack financing, for instance, uh, up to and including a, 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 you know, new kind of blockchain initiatives or what have you. So those are, those are some of the, you know, innovative ways that these investors, uh, I, I think kind of a, have adapted to the current markets. Um, right now it's, you know, I, 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 on your guys' last podcast you, or one of your previous podcasts, you talked about the uncertainty that there is in in the current environment um, with, with you know conflicts in East, Eastern Europe and uh, you know like a, a whole uh, a, you know ma- you know major economy in Russia being uninvestable on uh, there being ripples throughout the market where people are just acting with emotion. 
So, and right now, distressed investors are at the end of the day, they're value investors and are a little bit paralyzed in this type of market. But I, I, they're getting smart on a lot of these situations and will look to um, understand them when the you know emotions kind of start to settle down a little bit. And, and we'll see what type of environment we're in then because interest rates are rising, uh, you know, that it's going to lead to more defaults. Uh, the appetite for the degree of, of fiscal stimulus is going to be lower. So, you know, we, we could be looking at um, a, a very active market for the, the, the types of investors that are characterized in this book. Can I jump in with, uh, or Elliot, did you have a follow up? Uh, just one quick observation. I mean, it is interesting how these things repeat themselves. Like Barbarians of, at the Gate was like not that long ago in the grand scheme, but you know, a little before this. And then, you know, I guess one of the other things that was really interesting to me that that you referenced there too. But like, you know, KKR bought uh, Alliance Boots at a similar time, and both that and Caesars ended up like kind of money good. Is there something to be said about the quality of the assets, or is there something just crazy with the amount of leverage? That people put on these, uh, you know, I wonder about those things. Yeah, I think I, you know, like the the uh, on the downside too, right? The you know, uh, uh, your liquidity is not going to last as long as the irrationality of, of you know whatever situation is going on. But but I think you know the the these big investments, um, you know, the, like they they're they're premised upon you know pretty good established companies. That are you know are likely going to grow in value. It's just is there going to be a hiccup where you've levered it too much and they can't make their interest payments and you're going to hand control to the creditors. And that's you know it's a real balance right now. Uh, and uh, I, you know I don't think that they they're always going to get it right. So I have kind of a beginner question, uh, I guess, uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, Apollo was one of the big equity holders that I guess lost all their money. What was the other one? TPG. TPG. Yeah. So um, I guess the question is, you know, if these guys really believed that um, there was so much value in, in Caesars, I mean, they got huge funds. Couldn't they, they have just paid off the debt, kept control of the equity, and then tried to re-lever? I, it's a great point, and we we tried to provide a, a you know a comparable situation in Blackstone, right? Like uh, it, 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 in their investment in, in Hilton, uh, where you know it's roughly you know similar uh, sector, and they put more money in and wound up being one of the you know the best invest best returns that they ever got. Um, the there's some key differences with Caesars in that. Uh, you know, about a third of, of uh, Caesar's EBITDA came from Atlantic City, and then Atlantic City post Great Financial Crisis was just decimated because all of the northeastern states started issuing gaming licenses, and that you know, uh, um, building casinos, the revenue never actually came back. And so that was just one one stru- huge structural change that never would have changed things, and the leverage was maybe a little bit too much. So if you're talking about their initial equity check. Um, uh, it was was six billion dollars between the two private equity firms, uh, with a, a lot of that being provided also by other co investors. So they're you know at, at really at most are only putting in two billion dollars each, and the, the debt that was distressed was eighteen billion dollars. Um, it wasn't it, it it wasn't a great return that they would they were look. There was other opportunities that they could put capital work for better return. Otherwise, they probably would have done it. You know, and they're known for doing that, for buying back their own debt at a discount and then betting from benefiting from it. Uh, but in this case, it was just a little bit too much. I know we're we're bumping up against our our time limit here, so I just want to close with with one quick thought, which is people who've listened to this podcast before and know that I'm a huge fan of Matt Levine's writing at Bloomberg. I think he's absolutely brilliant and hilarious, and the way he explains things. He really knows what he's talking about. And when he dives into something, not only is it hilarious, but it's thought provoking because it kind of makes you think about why things are the way they are. And no less authority than Matt Levine is on the back jacket of your book with a blurb that says this is a superb inside account of what modern high finance is actually like. The strategies, the personalities, the relationships, the stress and the shouting. Fascinating, suspenseful and comprehensive. It's the barbarians at the gate of distressed debt. And I 
couldn't agree more. I plan to give this book and recommend this book to absolutely anyone who I, I get the question, you know, from time to time, what's this stuff really like? How does this stuff really work? And, and this book is just a fantastic example of that. So Max, thank you for joining us and congratulations again on the book. Really, really appreciate you guys having me. This is a great discussion. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.